Everybody, welcome to Indie Game Business. You have the pleasure of just being with me today because Dan is out in San Diego bouncing around TwitchCon and being important like he is. <laughs> today, I have Ivan Carrillo from Joystick Ventures with us, and we are going to be talking all about investing in indie games and all of that sort of good, fun stuff. But Ivan, let's start where we always start introduce yourself tell us how you got into the industry and then walk us through your career up to this point yeah absolutely thank you for having me jay uh well i joined the industry around six years ago on and off for a bit and then full time um like four years ago um it is very hard to break into venture capital and i was very lucky to join a bc fund here in mexico seven years ago as the CTO. My background is uh, computer science. Um, I, I spent around 12 years doing consultancy for a lot of companies. And then I wanted to do something in the video game industry. I have been a passionate gamer my whole life. And uh, I created this opportunity with the previous uh, fund manager or the manager of the previous fund where I used to work for. Um, and then we launched uh, Joystick Ventures and I've been uh, trying to find amazing indie studios for the past almost three years now. So you came into it much like me then. It was, you had not really experience on the business or the investment side. You came in from the coding angle? From the coding, I went to uh, Venture Capital. And then uh, after like traditional or as traditional as venture capital can be, I, I jumped to uh, the video game industry. Nice. So why did yeah. you pick why did you pick us of all the venture stuff <laughs> that you could go into? Well, I mean, I love uh, my games, right? Uh, I, I love my games as much as I love my music and my food. So I decided that I wanted to do something I love. That, well, that's how I ended up in the video game industry, pretty much. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of us ended up here. So <laughs> yeah. how did you, we're going to get off, I told you we were going to get on a tangent. And so we're going to get on a tangent before we even get to the second question. Sure. How did you learn the world of venture capital, not coming from, you know, an MBA or a business degree or, or something along those lines? So when I joined the the this fund in Mexico called NASCA, um, the fund was just starting, right? Uh, we, we didn't have a thriving community like we have right now in, in Mexico of, of funding and, and venture investments. Um, so pretty much from the ground up, I started doing some research with the fund manager. Um, he's an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. So we had our first share of trying to raise money for ourselves, for our own companies. Um, and when I started working on on this fund i didn't know nothing at all about fund management like i'm not gonna lie i didn't know anything uh but with the with the time uh seven years in the business i learned everything from people actually coming from mbas uh people that were for private equity uh they joined the fund they started putting things into place like the actual uh fun stuff that I didn't know. Um, and that's how I get to learn to manage a fund. And then I was, I felt that I was ready to, to make the jump and start my own fund because I, I, I thought that um, the, the industry has a very big gap uh, between the needs of the studios, you, you know this, uh, and, and the money available, right? There is a lot of money available, but the allocation of that money is it's very hard to 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 get, I would say, to get it right at least. So I, I'm very excited. I'm taking my first professional trip down to Mexico in a few yes. weeks to nice. through GammaCon. Yeah, tell us something. And this is one of the things that came up. I did a talk with a lot of the teams the other night, and you know they were talking about the challenges of you know not just Mexico, but you know building studios in in Mexico, Latin America, South America. Tell us something that we don't know about the Mexican game development scene. Um, the Mexican game development is well, we've been developing games for 25 years, for example. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Mexico 
has been in the forefront of a lot of the uh, technology or the, the, the tech companies uh, like Unreal. Unreal opened uh, an office a long time ago here. It didn't work out for them. Uh, I would say that one of the things that is very challenging here in Mexico is the um, education. We don't, we don't have a lot of uh, specialized programs for video games. We have some, but not enough. Um, and the other thing is uh, Mexico is one of the largest, if not the largest, I believe, uh, markets for video games in Latin America, even larger than Brazil, uh, which makes a very compelling business uh, opportunity. But people just think that it's very hard to break into gaming in Mexico, which it is. We don't have a lot of the uh, support from uh, from the Mexican government. Um, the money goes to to traditional business. Mexico is very risk adverse, so it's very challenging to convince someone to invest in video games. Uh, I was lucky enough to find at least around 15 people here in Mexico that wanted to invest in something different, and that's how I ended up raising the fund. And you're like, okay, listen, are you familiar with FIFA? That's what we're going to start with, and then we're going to go from there. We we see so much of the investment and the VC talk going into, you know, whatever the hot thing is right now, whether it's sure. NFTs, but there's also a lot in, you know, the bigger, more traditional AAA, huge studios coming out. That's not what you all invest in. No. Why did you opt for the indie game path? And tell us a little bit about, you know, the procedure, the the system that goes into investing in an indie studio versus investing in, well, I'm going to say all the traditional stuff in the industry. Um, well, I would say that it's completely different. Um, I mean, we, we are uh, obviously in the uh, revenue share investment model. Uh, uh, so that puts us really close to a publisher. Uh, at the same time, the reason why we decided to invest in, in indie games and not companies is, first of all, one of the things we re realized very early during our research, research process was that most um, managers of indie studios um, are still trying to figure out how to raise money for the studio. And that makes the conversations a little bit awkward. For example, um, my first conversation when we were uh, researching and exploring this path uh, with a, a small studio from, from Sweden, I believe, uh, I asked them, so do you want to raise money for, for your company? Yes. So how are you structuring the round? He was like, what, what round? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, and then I realized like all of my conversations were like that. So we tried to switch gears to something that made sense to them and made sense to us. Um, and in the end, uh, what we decided for us is that um, one of the main challenges in the, in, in the BC industry is uh, the liquidity. Um, you, lock, you invest in a fund, you lock your money there for the next seven to 10 years and I mean, good luck. You're probably going to see some money in seven or 10 years. So we wanted to change that for our investors, right? So the reason why, why we do uh, a revenue share model, um, it's because we wanted to give them or pay their investment back in two, three, four years instead of, of seven or 10. Uh, and that's how we ended up with, with this model, which obviously it's close to what publishers are doing. Uh, but we are not a publisher. We don't want to be a publisher. Uh, but at the same time, we tend to be very helpful with with the uh, with the studios and and do whatever we need. Right? We're very aligned with the success uh, of the game. And if the game is not successful, we are not successful, and we can't pay back to our investors. And that's a problem for me. I mean, so it, it is interesting because I mean, we've got clients as well who are investors, and they're like, but. We're not going to be publishers and i'm like hey look i've been a publisher i don't want to be a publisher either anymore. <laughs> i i completely see your point um sure. so what sort of you come in and you invest in a studio or a, or a project yeah. and what sort of support other than cash what do you do to help those studios along you know is it stuff that you do with the game itself or is it you know, helping them find publishers. 
What else is there involved in investment other than here's a check? Sure. So we are as hands on as the studio wants us to be. Um, and what I mean by that, for, just to give you a quick sample, we have one studio based in Sweden and they realized, because this is their first game, that they need a lot of help with development. So we're trying to find, we're helping them to find uh, a development company or other indie studio that might be able to help them. Uh, if they are going through lot check, we find them a Q&A company. We have obviously, we have worked uh, with a lot of, of those service providers before. So we have a massive list. Um, so we do anything they need. Uh, for example, if they are raising money for the studio, we help them structure uh, their uh, term sheet or save or whatever they need. Uh, if they are looking for investors, we try to help them find investors. So anything that they need, we do for them, like literally anything. I mean, my background is on the technical side. If they want me to go on the book, something on <laughs> Unreal or Unity, I can do that for sure. So I will do anything to help them succeed. All right. So we got our, our first question coming sure. in here. The my experience with Mexican Game Studios has nearly all of them working regularly for commercial television advertising agency work. Is that my sample bias or have you seen that prevalent as well? Uh, no, I, I think you're right. Uh, most of the studios do work for hire for marketing agencies uh, because they want to do games and don't start uh, and make some money. Uh, but in Mexico, it's very challenging, again, because we don't have all the resources that uh, uh, studios have in, in the European Union or Canada or Australia. We don't have any kind of tax breaks, right? So it's very hard to start from the ground up uh, um, here in Mexico if you want to develop a, a game or create a gaming company. It's very hard. Once you are running or walking, things get a little bit easier. We have some, obviously, some studios that uh, are international companies now, but they are still very small compared to to, to other um, to other companies from other regions. But yes, the answer is yes. And that's not just Mexico. That's a lot of, of Latin America, South America yeah. as well. A lot of the studios. But that... The danger there, I mean, yes, that, that can give you, the work for hire stuff can give you an, an, a foot in the door in the industry. And yeah. we do see a lot of folks come in from television animation and, and things like that. But you get stuck on what I call that dreaded treadmill when you start doing work for hire. And it's like, okay, we're going to do work for hire and take the profits and put it towards our game but then you actually either don't have enough profit or yeah. all the people are working on the work for hire and they can't really work on the the actual game that they want to make and so that's where that's where you come in and it's like hey we need extra money sure so as an indie studio like what are what is the best time to start looking for money Oh, that's a great question. So I would say it depends on the investor you're looking for, right? So we're very bullish um, on, on people. So we tend to invest on the people developing the game rather than in a particular game. If, if I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, our main focus is... Uh, do you have the background experience or do you have the drive to develop a game? And if yes, we have funded uh, four games in a concept stage. So they didn't even have a playable build. So some other publishers or investors prefer to see something playable, feel something, and that's fine too. So I would say instead of focusing only on when do you think it's the best time to raise money? Try to find the right investors for you, right? If, For example, if you are a game development agency here in Mexico and you've been doing work for hire for marketing agencies for 10 years and now you, you would like to create your own IP, uh, well, you have a lot of technical background most likely, but you probably don't have enough uh, experience developing your own IPs. Uh, but then... It is very easy for us to say, hey, 
uh, do you have a new concept? Yes, we would like to develop this. Well, we can probably commit to that, right? So it depends. I, I don't have a definite answer, a final answer for that. But um, instead of focusing on what you want, try to see what's available in the market. I think we lost Jay. I can probably start selling myself. Like, I love games. The last one I've been playing has been um, Hades. Uh, I mean, I love Hades, don't get me wrong, but for um, roguelites, probably it's Lady Spider. Card based games are my favorite games. Uh, I play Magic the Gathering for a long time. Uh, it was. It was a very interesting process. It changes the way you see problems. Um, yeah, Jay is gone. Um, but then um, I, I spent a lot of time, and I actually was putting a lot of, of time in uh, in uh, uh, in playing Magic, learning everything. Um, but then I was I was ready to to move as to 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 try to to go pro uh, playing magic but i realized that was not for me i wanted to do something else with my life um let me see i think we have some questions from the chat uh where is this uh genius no oh i don't see any questions hey chat do you know where I can find the questions? Post session podcast questions. Oh, there you go. Uh, no, I don't see any questions. Uh, but anyway, um, I tried to go pro and I I decided to go on a, a different path and I ended up studying computer science, which was fantastic. Uh, I, I Well, I actually went to... Um, uh engineering first and i hated it like i don't know why oh youtube chat oh, really uh comments oh there you go questions yeah so my computers decided that we were done and <laughs> 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 and reboot okay so um did we did, did you start on any of the questions or? no no i was just yeah, right, myself <laughs> All right. So from uh, Avril on YouTube, what does a publisher do that Joystick Venture doesn't do? And can you give an example? And this is an excellent question because a lot of people aren't familiar with the difference between an investment group and a, and a publisher. Sure. So I would say the first thing that um, we don't do that a publisher does is in theory, we are not, since we're not publishing the game, um, the responsibility to publish the game goes to the studio, uh, in theory. In practice, that's not what we've been doing for the past three years. Um, so in theory, th that's the theory, right? Uh, but in practice, that that that's not the reality. The other thing that we, we doesn't do in theory is... Um, we don't have producers. Uh, well, that's actually true. We don't have any producers. Uh, and you are in control completely of your development process. Uh, we don't, I mean, we can probably give you some guidance if you ask for it, but the studio is 100% um, or the studio owns 100% of the development process. We, we are not involved in that in any in any way at all. If we see any business opportunity outside of what you're doing, for example, hey, it would be great to integrate with Twitch. Why? Because this is a roguelite or a speedrunner or whatever. We're probably going to say something like that, but we 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 don't we are not involved in the development process in, in any way. You give us your milestone schedule, we stick to that, and that's it. Um I uh, probably that's the the one thing. I mean, in theory, there are a lot of things that we don't do. 
in reality, we do everything we can do to to help studios. You, you, to sum it up, you help the studios get to the point where they can go to market by having a game that is ready, but you don't do any of the actual going to market, the, the community building and the marketing and the distribution and That's right. all the stuff that traditional publishers do. Exactly. I mean, we obviously have service providers for that and they help the, the studio uh, to do that if they need any any help, but we don't do that ourselves, no. Uh, the other thing that uh, we can do, but we haven't, is co-invest with publishers. Uh, terms are very hard to to come by and the reason why is um, we tend to, to, to fund or try to fund 100% of the development and we, we would like to find a publisher that want to participate pro rata with the risk and upside. That's easier said than done. So, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so we 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 haven't co invested with any with any publishers, uh, but we're open to do that. All right. So uh, everyone wants to know: Do you all invest in solo devs? And if so, what are the criteria that you're looking for? And that actually bleeds into a bigger question of, sure. you know, in general, what are the criteria that you all typically look for? Sure. So we we invest in solo devs. Uh, yes, we have done that in the past. Um, it is extremely challenging for everyone. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying this is um, since we don't have any of these things that uh, publishers have, uh, we, we can provide you with a lot of like particular help or help in very specific ways that a, that a publisher can. So the answer, the short answer is yes. Long answer is it gets very tricky over time. Um, and the criteria we're looking for in general, uh, to be honest, we're looking for, if you're a solo developer and you have developed some games in the past, well, it's very easy for us to uh, review the opportunity, even if it's in a concept stage and say, hey, we like what we're seeing. We will try to explore uh, the option to invest. Um, and if we don't, you will know almost right away. Like we, we try to not waste your time. I mean, this is very hard. Uh, we, 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 we tend to, to answer very fast. There are some times like, for example, after Gamescom or after GDC where things go crazy really fast. Uh, but we tend to answer like in a week or so. Uh, if we're interested, if we're not interested, you will know almost the day after you apply. Um, and the criteria, it's uh, very simple. Uh, we review the game. If we like what we're playing, if we are playing something or if we like the concept, then we run our models. We are a fund, so we, we need to run our financial models. Uh, if that makes sense for us, um, well, we move forward with uh, investment terms we go back and forth and then we go to a long form agreement long term agreement and we sign the agreement so that's it the process usually takes a couple of months all in all yeah it's just it being we had to last it's like how long does it take to get a publishing deal and, and it's gotten it's actually gotten longer since the pandemic i mean it takes on average what we're seeing somewhere sometimes four to six months uh, yeah between when you send something out to the publisher that is actually playable uh, yeah. to actually getting everything signed. So, I mean, what is your, what's your sweet spot for the amount that you want to invest in, you know, in studios or in projects? Sure. So we started with uh, 750,000 uh, to 1.2 million uh, USD. Um, in reality, most of the market is a little bit below that. And that's only for development uh, the development budget. Uh, we put a little bit more money for all the publishing, marketing, or or porting, or whatever we need uh, on top of that. Um, and most of our deals are in the 400 to 600 range right now. So, all right, let's, we, you are getting all the questions we may or may not get through. This may end up being just one big gigantic Q&A, which makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> so I don't I don't have to think. So does Joystick Ventures consider and or bring in specialists along the development cycle and marketing cycle? 
So for marketing, yes. For development, it's up to the developer to ask for help. So we're extremely flexible. And if the developers say something like, well, you know, I'm going to need uh, someone with a lot of uh, experience doing models, rigging, or whatever, we probably will go, um, well, not probably, we will go and find someone to help you. Uh, that's like optional. Like we, we haven't, the, the only we only have one studio right now that asked for that kind of help and it was for something for the engine um but we don't get a lot of those questions uh, for marketing purposes we're very focused on on marketing uh we have a small team we've been working with um uh, justin ramos and uh indie pops um Ashley Chen, they, they've been fantastic uh, helping with all the marketing and and uh, publishing and the stores and everything. Uh, we have a lot of people trying to work with us, uh, mainly on performance marketing. And we have an agency, uh, Renaissance from the UK. Uh, they've been working with us uh, for the past year. Uh, so yeah, we have a lot of specialists for, for marketing. We're really focused on that and for development, it's up to the studio to ask for help. If they need help, we will help them find someone. Okay, so I, I have a question. Sure. Why don't you have producers in house? It would seem that if you're investing in this project, yeah. you wanna make sure that it's going along the lines that it should be going and you need someone on your side protecting your interest. Is there is there a conscious reason for not having a producer? Um, so that's a really good question. That's a question that we've been asking ourselves for a long time. I'm not gonna lie. Um, so far things have gone really well, except for one of the investments. Um, not not because there was an issue with the studio. Uh, themselves, uh, the the project derail uh, around the the half of the development, like around half of the development. Um, besides that, one of the policies that we have is that we need to fund games and people that we can trust. So I know that it it feels a lot like a producer would give them. A lot of support and and be on our side, but at the same time, we we are investing in people that we believe know what they are doing. And out of the nine investments that we have, only one has gone south because of that. And then the studio was kind enough to make up for that. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't see right now any reasons to to hire a producer. Things have gone really well, surprisingly well. Uh, so if it's not broken, don't fix it. <laughs> Wait, so did you just say out of the 90 investments? Nine, nine, nine. Oh, nine. I was like, I'm holy sorry. shit. I mean, if you've nine. done 90 investments no. and one's gone nine. sideways, yeah, you don't need a publisher. Nine, nine. Uh, <laughs> so specific question that's going to lead into a bigger question. Do you invest in mobile MMO? MMORPGs. But the bigger question is, when you're looking at investment, are there specific platform genres that you're looking at? So we feel more comfortable with PC and consoles initially. Uh, we can do mobile investments. We haven't. Uh, we can. Uh, but we don't have the expertise. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie. That's not our focus. So, uh, I mean, we could, if we find a, a good co-investment partner, with a lot of experience in the industry. Um, so the answer is yes, but, uh, yeah. The, the answer on this show is always, it depends, but we will accept yes, it but depends. as well. That's <laughs> up. <laughs> I mean, but it is, it's like, there's this is the same reason you don't see a lot of publishers that do, you know, premium games at the same time they're doing free to play games. It's, it's two completely different Oh, completely different. Yeah, we we tr we, we tr tried to explore the the possibility. I actually before Gamescom, I was uh, lucky enough to go to um, Turkey. Uh, Turkey has a very vibrant uh, community of mobile developers. 
Um, and I met with a lot of really amazing studios there. And I mean, I, I knew it was different, like mobile and premium and PC and consoles. But being there was just eye-opening. Like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm not even going to try. Like, this is completely different. So, I mean, we can, but the reality is that it's so different that we we wouldn't feel comfortable investing alone in a, in a mobile game. So... From Jim, does Joystick do seed funding based on a studio's portfolio? And again, bleeding into a bigger one, what are the little things behind the scenes that you're looking for when you're looking at a studio? Sure. So uh, seed funding based on a studio's portfolio. Um, if you're if you're asking about uh, equity investment or investments in the in the portfolio, we decided that well, we can. Um, we haven't done any equity investments, but we can. And we decided that we want to do equity investments in the companies of the studios we previously funded, right? So if we already fund uh, a game, we are open to do equity investment with the small tickets, uh, 250000 which is fairly small for... Uh, for a studio, uh, but it's massive if there are only three people in the studio and they want to go bigger than that, right? Uh, but since my background is on the VC industry, on the tech VC, traditional VC industry, um, it gets very challenging to justify equity investments. Um, the reason why is for an equity investment to work, you need uh, every investment that you do from a VC fund needs to pay back your fund size, right? If the fund is 50 million, every investment, it doesn't matter if it's 100,000 or 5 million, it needs to pay at least the 50 million, right? So that's the math for VC funds. So it gets very challenging to justify that math for um, indie studios unless they want to go big, like really, really big. Right. And uh, I haven't found most or some of those. It's, it's, if you're willing to actually generate money and make money in this industry, Ivan, I think that's part of the problem right there. It's you give it, <laughs> you, given how so many of these things do, it, it's it's always a challenge. I mean, when you're looking at because so many of these games, you know, aren't successful at the end of the day. Yeah. What are some of the initial red flags or warning signs that you see when you're starting to look at a project or a team? Um, I think that one of the first things that come to mind is uh, in relation to IPs, like some of the opportunities that we've seen Either they are they have some IP with very sketchy rights, or they need to acquire an IP to quote be successful, and that makes thing that makes the conversation very very weird. Uh, so that's a red flag immediately for me. I I rather invest in uh, original IP, a random thing that nobody thought before than Bruce Lee. Right, so um, that's one. The, the other thing that uh, it's a red flag is um, when founders are not a hundred percent committed to to the studio and the game. That makes very challenging for us to to commit to an investment. And I know a lot of people are going to say, "Well, I have my day job and I would like to develop." Well, that's true, and a lot of people are willing to quit their job um, after we commit. And that's fine. We can do that. We have done that before. Um, but if they are not willing to, to commit, it feels like, uh, like uh, I don't know, um, I don't know, it, it, it doesn't feel right. Like if people are not willing to, to commit full time to, to their game and their company, 
that's a very, very big red flag right there. Um, what else? Oh, the other thing that it's, it has happened to me a lot is uh, budgets. Like people have no idea how to put a budget together. And that makes the conversation very challenging because we obviously have an investment committee, right? We are a fund. We need to go back with five of our investors and say, hey, guys, this is our case. This is the opportunity. We think this is a really good opportunity. If I go with my investment committee and the numbers feel sketchy from the get-go, um, I mean, it's going to be very challenging to approve an investment. So forecast, actually, I mean, uh, budgets actually uh, makes conversations really awkward when they don't know how to answer a question about their budget. That makes the conversation very awkward. It, it, and that is challenging for a lot of studios because, yes. you know, once again, the, the whole reason that we do all of this is because no one teaches that business side of the industry and you can't do an accurate budget if you don't have an accurate production plan. And so sure. if you don't have that, it all builds into one another. And I see this all the time as well. It's like, you know, yep. we talk to a studio and they're like, there's eight of us in London and it's going to take us two years and we need $70,000. And I'm like, that doesn't remotely <laughs> yeah. add up properly. Yeah. But a lot of it is because they sit and they go, oh, well, we're not going to pay ourselves or, yeah. you know, we're doing this on nights and weekends. And I'm like, no one is going to, you know, invest from a publishing or investor standpoint if you're not committed to doing this. But at the same time, you have to pay yourself. You're part yeah. of that as well. You yeah. can't just hope to God that the ramen noodles are going to hold out. No, and, and we, we, we tend to align the risk or, yes, align the risk of all the parties involved, right? If you are not paying yourself, that's a big no-no for us, right? Because you are getting a lot of the downside without the upside, right? You are not getting, you are not making money right now. Uh, you're getting money from an investor that is going to take uh 50% of your money once you launch your game or 80% or 100% or any percentage, right? Um, and then you are not going to be motivated enough to finish the game. So that doesn't make any sense for us, right? Um, so we need to align the, the interest of all parties. And that's what we've been trying to do with all our investments. So, all right, hold on, let me catch up here because we got a lot of this stuff coming in and usually sure. Dan is like funneling me these questions and, and he's not today. <laughs> so, um, and from Ronnie says, look at the portfolio. It looks like you're focused on smaller, slim titles. Do you have specific genres that you prefer to invest in? That's a really good one. So uh, I'm going to, to split the, or I'm going to try to explain why we have those titles in our portfolio. When we started the fund, we wanted to create a portfolio, a very solid portfolio with very high quality games. I mean, we obviously everybody's going to say any investor or publisher, we invest in high quality games. Obviously, uh, the, the the way we structure our portfolio was trying to find games with a high ceiling, uh, high floor. I'm sorry, and maybe not uh, as high of uh, of the ceiling or or ceiling as high as the, as the floor, right? So we might not make 20x or 20 times our investment, but we wanted to have a very solid portfolio uh, to share with other studios, right? And say, hey, we have these games in our portfolio. What do you think about these games? Well, they look fine. I might be able to work with these guys, right? So, uh, and with our investors too, we, we were still raising money when we launched the, the, the fund. Um, interesting thing we launched the fund in february 2020 so it was very challenging to raise money anyway uh because of the pandemic uh but uh it helped us a lot right uh the four games that you can see in our website uh follow this strategy the other games that we are funding and we will update the website once we announce the other investments are completely different to any of those games. I mean, most of the games in our current portfolio are point and click adventure or puzzle games. Um, that's just uh, uh, like that happened. Like it's not our main focus to 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 fund only those genres. 
uh, we have a speedrunner, we have a, a card deck building game with roguelite multiplayer online uh, coming. Um, we have another game that was announced during um, Realms Deep, which is an FPS. Um, Phantom Fury, which is not in our website, uh, but uh, we funded that one. So we have a lot of, of di different games in different genres that we we're funding. So the games I love, my favorite game of all time is Green Fandango. So the point and click comes from there. Uh, and Chrono Trigger. Um, so those two might be the, the, the games that I love the most for whatever reason. But now I play a lot of core games like this lady aspire magic the gathering uh hades hollow knight uh that sells like metroidvanias rogue lights i love those uh but we found any game in any genre so how do you this is a question from uh from, from joker is how do you go about evaluating a team if it's just one programmer and a lot of artists is that balance something that you look for is it okay if the teams are distributed is what when you're sitting down and evaluating the team behind the game itself what do you look for and does it matter if they're all in one place or a full team or how does that come into it yeah it doesn't matter for us it doesn't matter uh i think it's about trying to find the right balance if there is only one developer and multiple artists because that what makes sense for for the game, uh, that's great. And if you are developing an online co-op multiplayer game based on a lot of systems, you're probably going to need uh, 10 developers and, and five artists, I don't know, right? So it depends. Like, we're not uh, focused on on that. that. I would say that's something that... Uh, would make sense for someone looking for a specific balance. We're not. I mean, we we know for sure that developing games, uh, it's not, uh, it's an art, right? In, in a way. So what works for the studio works for the studio, and if they are uh, doing great, well, that works for us too. Um, uh, talking about the social media, um, it's been getting very challenging to measure any social media results, right? I mean. Uh, word of mouth, it's probably the best way to distribute your content. But having a massive amount of followers, or even right now, from what we've seen, having a lot of wish lists, it doesn't make a lot of, of, of sense from a review uh, perspective, right? Uh, the reason why I'm saying that the conversion rate is way lower than it was a year ago with the wish list. And social media is just about noise. But at the same time, if you already have like a really strong IP and a huge following, well, that makes things very interesting, right? Um, so again, like Jay said, it depends. It, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> but I mean, I, I do. I see so many developers and they're like, well, we're never going to be able to get a publisher. Or we're never going to be able to get an investor because we only have 500 wish lists and our discord is 40 people. And I'm like, that's, this is one of those little things, you know, when we sit down and when we're scouting for these publishers and investors and they give us that feedback on a project, it's like, well, this game's only got, you know, 400 people following it or whatever. And I'm like, yes, because they're a developer. They're not a marketing agency. They need a publisher or an investor to come in and do this and help them with it. So I do think that a lot of studios get way too wrapped around, you know, how much social media presence and, and community they have. And yes, you do need to be working on it, but it's not the end all be all. I mean, no, and I'm going to tell you a little secret. I try to find personally all those studios with a very small social media count or presence uh and the reason why is because there are some amazing gems out there yes. that obviously are really focused on developing the game and they don't have enough time to 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 interact in social media and that's fine right we're going to help them get there and we're going to develop a plan if they need a plan and we're going to do again whatever we need to do to help them succeed and if that means increasing your 
Twitter account, Twitter follower count from 500 to 10,000, well, we can probably focus on that, right? Uh, but yeah, it's not the end all be all thing for us. All right, so we've got several questions to come in yet. I'm just going to summarize several of these. When it comes to building the budget to yep. figuring out what to budget for, are there resources aside from you know the indie game business YouTube page and all of those resources? Are there resources that you can point to that say, okay, look, this is how you should go about making that initial production plan, and this is how you should go about building your budget for a new indie studio? Uh, well, yes. I think that w one of the things that we've been doing for a long time, and I'm uh, trying to give a little bit of guidance here on how to approach us, is we take a look at cost of living in different regions and we know we live in a, a connected world. So people can work from home and be distributed around the world. So we're really focused on trying to find the right balance for cost of living, right? If, for example, uh, a studio from South America, I'm not going to say which country, but uh, from South America sent us a budget uh, like a year and a half ago saying, hey, we need a million and a half to develop this game. And we went and do our research about cost of living. And we were like, uh, I'm sorry, are all the developers based in your country? Yes. Like how? Like how are you going to justify the 1.5 million if, you're, if you only have 10 developers or the, the, the team is 10 people? And this is the cost of living for your country. Like, what are you going to do? Well, we want to provide better opportunities. Well, you're charging more than people living in Sweden. <laughs> like, how are you going to justify that, right? <laughs> so we start from the very ground up. You, you need to be very honest about that because we go, I mean, our background is finance. So we go very deep in the finance stuff. Um, other resources, I would say, just try to be honest and say, we don't need very on-point budgets. We need a general picture of where would you like to go, right? We know things change and uh, and the budget is going to change and the development cycle is going to change and all those things change over time. And we are okay with that change. Some investors or publishers are not. We're okay with that. We know that's how things are. But... If you do as much research as you can, going from uh, cost of living to some of the taxes in, in, in the country, uh, just to say, hey, for example, in Mexico, uh, we have a 16% uh, tax on something. Well, maybe I need to increase my budget 16%. Okay, well, that makes sense, right? It just proves that you did your homework. We want to see that you did your homework uh, with the budget. And if not, we can, we're we probably going to say, hey, you are not paying yourself en uh, enough or you need to pay your developers a little bit more, right? So if we see something that feels weird, we will point it out right away. The, the most important thing is making sure that you are paying yourself an honest to God yeah. living wage. Yeah. yeah. Reddit and Twitter are fantastic for running around people <laughs> bragging about how they worked for three years on no money and they ate ramen. That's not good. No, that's, that's not good. Stupid, for lack yeah. of a better word. You need to make sure that you're actually paying yourself, or or at least you know if you're investing that sweat equity, that you have a plan for getting it back at some exactly. point in time. It's not. It's not cool to be, no. you know, stressing yourself when you're working. Pay yourself. And again, uh, can I add something to that? Oh, I mean, absolutely. Uh, th this is a little bit on the personal side, but uh, I think I'm aligned with that uh, thought because when you are managing a fund, people probably don't know this, but I'm not getting a lot of money. I'm not making a lot of money right now, but obviously I'm aligned with the success of the fund, right? So if the fund is successful, uh, I'm probably going to make more money than I'm making right now. And I think it's the same thing with games, right? You probably don't want to overpay you if you are aligned with the success of the game. 
right? If you believe the game is going to be successful and you find the right partner and they help you get there, uh, you're probably going to make way, way more money down the road, right? So you need to be aligned with the success in the in the things you were doing. So I just wanted to point that out. All right, so we've got like 10 minutes left. This has gone sure. far faster than I <laughs> thought it would, it would go here. So sure. if you've got any other questions, um, pop them in chat. Let us know. We'll absolutely get things answered. What do, so aside from, well, I'm going to say a demo, but you said, you know, you all have invested in very, very early, early stage stuff. So aside from the, the information on the game, and yep. the budget. What do the teams need to have in place when they pitch to you, when they submit to you? Sure. If the game is in a concept stage, we want to see a GDD equivalent. I mean, I know that a lot of people are not uh, working on GDDs right now, but uh, or <laughs> hasn't been for a long time, but something that represents the actual product uh, in the end. Uh, if it's a system-based game, what kind of systems? If it's an online game, we want to know that you have either experience or you have someone that can uh, solve all the technical issues uh, with the online systems. So all the information that you can share with us, remember that we need to make a decision with what we have, right? And I. I'm okay going through a lot of documentation if you have that and say, oh, in the end I understood or, oh, well, I don't have enough information to make a decision, right? I'm most likely going to pass. If that's the case, I'm most likely going to pass. Uh, so I prefer to go through a lot of uh, documentation. So share anything that you feel that it's going to make me uh, go for a, a positive uh, decision. And yes. So one of the questions is, how do we get in touch with Ivan? So it's right there on the bottom of the screen, and I will drop it in chat as well. But if you just go to joystickventures.com slash contact dash us, <laughs> yeah. that's how you can get in touch. Um, all right, Arthur has a good question because, not that the rest of them haven't been good, but it just popped up right here. And I was like, hey, that's a good question. Do you invest in games that are already in early access? Because this is always a tipping point with with publishers and investors as well. If they're already in early access, are you interested in investing? Yes. Next question. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so we, we, yes, I mean, it only makes sense. I remember, I come from the tech uh, startup world, right? If you are in early access and you have traction, any kind of traction, and you're looking for money. I mean, wh why wouldn't I? Like, <laughs> I know that's. Uh, I laugh. <laughs> yes, but it, 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 I'm, I agree with you. It, it, but it still confounds me. You know how many companies are like, "Oh no, you've already launched early access. We can't control the marketing narrative." Who gives a shit if it's going to like make money? I mean, that is, isn't my old boss years and years and years ago. We were sitting in these meetings and he's like, what's the goal? And we, other people would, would think things. And I'm like, the goal is to make money. And he goes, yes, that's what the goal is. Now, if that's your goal and you can find a game that's already in early access, but you can invest in it or you can publish it and make it better and it's going to make more money. Why not? But Why I mean, not? Hell, that there's a lot of them that don't do it. So yeah. um, <laughs> without going into anything that is NDA wise, let me preface this question. What kind of deals do you make, you know, with regards to recouping as in percentages? Because this is another one that comes up, you know, an, an awful lot. Like what's the breakdown on the Sure. So, so this is a very interesting question because just I think yesterday uh, Johan asked something on Twitter about how many publishers uh, have a rev share from the get go, right? From from first unit sold, and I think being raw fury, and I know that uh, they recoup a hundred percent, and it's okay. I, I, I <laughs> no. The, the reason why I think it's okay that and they can do that and we can't, it's because they can probably recoup 
the the budget on day one, right? Uh, and that's okay. I mean, if the studio feels confident enough about getting their money uh, really fast, they're probably going to get... Uh, uh, Rough Fury is obviously a very good option. Uh, we do uh, usually a 80-20 split uh, until we recoup and then 50-50. So wait, wait. very straightforward. Who, who gets the 80? Who gets the 20? So Joystick Ventures gets 80% and the studio gets 20% from the first dollar. Um, and once we recoup, we, we uh, split or change the revenue split to 50-50. Uh, that is completely different for every single deal. For example, with one of the investments, we went straight to 50-50. Um, there is another studio where we split 70-30, and there are other, and then 45-55 or something like that. And it depends, and depends on the stage of the development of the studio, right? If the studio already put 40% of the budget, we're not going to ask for more than 60%. Uh, before equipment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love this. Because, because I was in that thread as well. He said that Raw Fury is confident enough with their user base and they have an accurate picture of how fast the recoup happens. And that's usually relatively quick. Sure. And one, that is the sign of a good publisher that they sure. can predict that sort of stuff. But two, that is also very rare because a lot of times it is very, very hard to predict we can all do estimations we do comp analysis on this side for our clients oh, yeah. too but as i explained to one of our scouts the other day it's estimated guessing that's what it is you yeah. can only be so accurate in it um but i mean that is a that range that you have is a very clear point and, and i cannot stress this enough because I get this question every time I do a panel or anything like that. It's like, what's a good deal? What's a normal deal? There is no normal deal. I mean, that doesn't exist. You know, and the hate that some of these people get, you know, especially Johan and I have talked about, you know, when they released their contract out, how, you know, they became so vilified. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. The companies with <laughs> shitty contracts don't put them on the internet. For the reason. Yeah. But there's not a normal, a whatever. It's it's a complete variation out there. And I really wish that we would have people on Twitter and Reddit stop like shitting on deals when they say, oh, that's a horrible split. But you have no idea <laughs> what goes into this stuff. Yeah. Um, so, all right. Ivan, I think we've gotten through all the questions while I'm summing up. If we've got time for one more that I missed, somebody pointed out, pop it in there. But We've got your list. People can go to joystickventures.com slash contact dash us and find out more, submit. Is there anything else coming up in the next little bit that you would like to plug and or promote or anything like that? Uh, well, go and buy Lost in Play. Fantastic game. We all love it. 98% uh, positive reviews on Steam. Uh, it's actually an amazing point and click adventure. Uh, I'm not going to lie. If you haven't, Give it a try. Uh, and we're going to announce around four to seven games uh, before the end of the year. So, and those are going to be very different from what we have in the portfolio. And if you have not had enough of Joystick Ventures this week, uh, next week, our guest is Marcella, who I'm not going to lie. We may not even talk about games because her life in general has been so interesting. <laughs> we all met up drinks and, and Gamescom. Uh, that's going to be another fun one. Uh, but Ivan, thanks. All right. So wait, hold on a second. We've got one more. All right. I'm going to get one more in here, Connor. Our team's in multiple talk with publishers, but some of our interactions seem to grow cold in long email change. Our time developing has been hindered with waiting for progress on these talks. Is it proper? Is it improper to ask for a yes or no instead of waiting months for a maybe? Uh, again, uh, based on what you said about, uh, are there any, uh, what's the right deal? Well, I think everything is, about context, right? So this is about context. Is the developer, I mean, the publisher or investor very straightforward? We are very straightforward. 
And if you want to a yes or no right now, and we haven't had the chance to go through the opportunity, I'm probably going to say no right away, right? I can probably come back in six months or three months or two weeks and say, hey, I said no, but I have time now to review the opportunity. So give me some time, right? So you can ask. It depends on the on the other side. It's it's not about the studio. It's about the other side. Do they have enough bandwidth? Do they have enough time? Yeah. So uh, to be honest, I rather ask. Personally, I rather ask. Kind of keep in mind these things can take a long time, four to six months. My general rule is, you know, are they just saying, "Hey, this looks nice, and we're going to get back to you," or are they asking actual, honest to god, due diligence questions? Because if it's the latter, yeah. you're going somewhere. Yeah. If you're getting the whole, we really like this. Show it to us when it's a little further along. Yeah. That's a polite, most likely no, but yeah. you still have to keep going and you still have to keep plugging along. That's just, don't let it hinder your development. I mean, at the end of the day, you got to keep, you know, doing the development side of it, but one, make sure you're talking to enough publishers. And I know it's, it's daunting, but you have to do that. Um, but two, you know, I'm like Ivan, but I've also been doing this for 25 years. I am a very no bullshit person. It's like, do you want to do this or not? I mean, yeah. just give me an idea. As long as you ask more politely than I normally do, that's fine. Yeah, exactly. But Some, and sometimes it's only about bandwidth, right? So, for example, we are behind, and I'm, 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 I'm very honest about that. We're behind with our review process. We usually try to respond in a week or two. Uh, it's been two months, and we are... We, we have a huge backlog of, of games that uh, we are still trying to review. So, uh, yeah. So I will ask. If you ask me, I will ask. All right, Ivan. Thank you so very much. I am looking forward to seeing you in Mexicali in a few weeks. Hopefully, hopefully. Oh, what do you mean, hopefully? <laughs> I hear they have great Chinese Mexican food, which I have no idea what that is, but it they sounds do? fantastic. Oh, really? That, that's what Hugo told me. He said it's a special kind of Chinese. I, I'm in. Okay. All right. Everybody, go one. Thank you all for Triple R Presents for helping us do this for the last several months. We adore you folks. So if you've got a game to pitch, pitch it to them as well. But also, go and check out Joystick Ventures. We will be back next week with more Joystick Ventures. <laughs> and Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Have a good one.